Good morning. Well, today we've reached the last in our series of exploring the theme of worship through the Psalms and I've been given the title of Worship as Warranty. I wonder what comes to mind when you hear the word warranty. Now, I'm sure you've seen these things before. I hope you can pick this up on the on the camera there, this thing here. It's a royal warrant and these are issued for services of tradesmen to the royal family. They can put it on their merchandise as a, a badge of honour, if you like, and it's issued because of the quality or the consistency of the service provided. I don't know about you, but if I see a product has a royal warrant on it, I expect it to be a quality product. I expect the royal family to have the best, so we trust it to deliver excellence. Or maybe it's that piece of paper you get with a new fridge or car or toaster that reassures you that if something goes wrong, you can go back to the seller and they will fix it. Indeed, the dictionary definition is of a written guarantee to fix something if it goes wrong within certain parameters. But you know, you can replace the word warranty with other words like assurance, guarantee, promise, commitment or covenant that convey a similar meaning. The person issuing the warranty is confident of the quality of their product and is effectively saying, you can trust this product, this service, me, to deliver what's promised. Now, I like to think of myself as a trustworthy kind of person. So if I got this piece of paper, and on this piece of paper, if I can find my pen, which is around here somewhere, um, I was to write, £10. Okay. And then I asked you to take this to the supermarket and do some shopping for me. Would they take it? Of course not. What about if I sign it? Okay. Would they take it now? Of course they wouldn't. But what about if my name was um, Sarah John or her predecessor, Victoria Cleland? And uh, I was the chief cashier for the Bank of England and on it I wrote, I promise to pay, pay the bearer the sum of £10. Would that piece of paper be okay? What makes the difference and gives us the assurance is the person's credentials, that they have the authority and ability to deliver on the promise. As you might have guessed, Sarah John, is actually the chief cashier for the Bank of England right now. So when I was asked to reflect on worship as warranty, I was a bit puzzled. I asked myself the question, why does worship serve as a warranty for us? These are not two things I would normally put together in the same sentence. But the truth is, from start to finish, the Bible is full of God's covenant promises to his people. Through its pages, God reveals himself to us, who he is, what he's doing. And he lays out his credentials that show why he is trustworthy and able to do what he says he will. Remember Exodus 34 that both Ronald and Guy have mentioned in previous weeks. God reveals himself as the Lord, compassionate and gracious slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, forgiving yet not letting sin go unpunished, and able to do more than we could ask or imagine. And ultimately, he reveals himself in Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, who came to show us what God and his kingdom really looks like and to become the ultimate sacrifice in God's plan to redeem and restore the whole of creation, including you and me. Jesus says to his disciples in John 14, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you'd really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus replied, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. 
God demonstrates throughout the Bible in a much greater way than the chief cashier of the Bank of England that he has the authority and ability to deliver on his promises to those who put their trust in him. So I want to suggest that worship as warranty is because through worship we remind ourselves of God's promises to us, of his character that underpins those promises and makes them rock solid like the best guarantee that goes on forever and never runs out. As we worship, we remind ourselves just who God is, what he has done, is doing and will do for us, and our confidence rises that he can and, <clears throat> that he can and will keep his promises to us. As we worship, we therefore need to thank him and praise him for who he is and all he does. We have some great songs of worship that help us reflect on God's character and promises. What about give thanks to the Lord, our God and King, his love endures forever. For he is good, he's above all things, his love endures forever. Or what about the chorus of the, the song Waymaker? where God is the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. And then there's those great hymns, and can it be, great is thy faithfulness, immortal, invisible, God only wise. And then one of my favourites, King of Kings. In the darkness we were waiting, without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes, to fulfil the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word, from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt, and so on. Songs of worship remind us of who God is and what he has done, what he is doing and will do. But we've seen over the past few weeks that worship is more than just singing, important as this is. It's about submitting our lives wholeheartedly to the Lordship of Jesus, obeying his commands and becoming more like him as he works by his spirit in us and through us to make us more people, more like Jesus, and as Mark said, in more places. As I've been praying through what to say today, I kept coming back to Psalm 23 as a wonderful illustration of worship as warranty. So grab your Bible and let's take a look at it together. Psalm 23 is David's song of worship to the God who he knows has delivered on his promises and will continue to do so. It's probably the best known of all the Psalms, often spoken as words of comfort to people going through tough times. To some of you, it's so well known, you could recite it word for word. There is so much in it to encourage us and remind us of God's goodness, grace and mercy. But I wanna focus on the first verse because pretty much everything else that follows hangs on that verse. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. One of the images often used to describe God's relationship with his people is that of a shepherd and his sheep. And many of you will know that Jesus described himself as the good shepherd in John 10, who's willing to stick by his sheep, those who know him, no matter what, and even to lay down his life for them. David talks about God in the same way in Psalm 23. He uses his experience of being a shepherd to reflect on God as the shepherd who has provided, led and guided him in the past, in the present and into the future. And so with a sense of celebration almost, David can say that he lacks nothing because the Lord is his shepherd. Verses one to three, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me besides quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Now, I know little about sheep and have been fascinated to learn about them as I prepared for today. Of all the livestock, apparently, they need the most care and supervision and their welfare depends on the expert care and management of the shepherd. This would have been especially true in the parched areas that David would have been knowing in the sheep country of Israel. 
The sheep's very survival depended on the expert knowledge, leading and preparation of the shepherd. As we read this psalm, we imagine this. Green fields full of rich grass and sheep happily munching away. But the reality for David would have been much more like this. Even today, most sheep live in the mountainous regions of the world. But you know what, I discovered that there's an area in the hill country of Engedi that David would have been familiar with called Green Pastures. To the naked eye, this would look like a rocky hillside to you and I, but shepherds with their local knowledge and experience understand that in amongst the rocks, tufts of grass appear almost overnight due to the heavy dew that brings moisture. They lead their sheep along well-worn paths that allow the sheep to access this vegetation. The shepherd knows the right paths to take for the sheep to flourish. So too for David it is with God his shepherd, the one he trusted to guide him and lead him through the uncharted waters of life. The same is true for us. When we trust the Lord as our shepherd, he guides us and leads us to green pastures, safe spaces and places where we can rest and be refreshed. But it's not just physical care on offer here, it's soul care. He restores my soul. In Matthew 11, Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When we feel like we're carrying the weight of the world on our shoulders, Jesus says, come to me to find rest from the burdens that you carry. His promise is rest for our souls. So I was reading that there are four key things that are required to get sheep to lie down and rest. They need to be free from fear, free from friction and discontent within the flock, free from disease and parasites, and free from hunger. David's expectation of a good shepherd would be one who watches over his sheep and understands when they're feeling frightened, discontent, sick or aggravated by ticks and fleas and flies or hungry. He would know that the presence of the shepherd calms the sheep and takes away their fear, fighting off predators and looking out for their safety. And as with most herds and flocks, there's a pecking order amongst the animals, which leads to tension when they pick on each other to gain their way to pole position. The shepherd's presence would dissipate that rivalry between the sheep and cause them to focus on him rather than each other. One of the most aggravating things for sheep apparently is the flies and parasites that if not dealt with can cause harm to the animal. Here, sheep are dipped in chemicals and fleeces are removed through shearing to help them. But in hotter countries, it's not uncommon for the shepherd to mix up an oil-based ointment that they pour over the sheep's head, which wards off these aggravating flies and relieves their distress and brings them peace. And sheep that are hungry will constantly be on the move, unsettled, looking for food. A good shepherd takes his sheep through the best pastures available so that they have enough to eat. David reminds us that God is our good shepherd whose presence allays our fears, helps us to refocus our anxious thoughts, heals our diseases and feeds us in a way that nourishes our very souls. He does that because he cares about us, but also because his reputation, his very name is at stake. He goes ahead of us, guiding us on the right path that leads to peace, rest and safety. I wonder if David was looking out at the hills when he wrote this. Sheep, I'm told, like to stick to the same path, so over the time, tracks would have been carved into the hillside as they followed the same route around the mountains. In fact, you can still see these well-worn tracks today. 
The psalm then goes on to say in verse four, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Even when we walk through the darkest valleys, which we will, we are guaranteed his reassuring presence. Some of us right now are in that darkest place and it's hard. Jesus said in John 16 that we'd have to face some tough stuff in life. Just because we follow him doesn't make us immune from heartache, pain and sadness. Last Sunday, Guy led our reflection on worship as weeping and likened us to clay pots. Some get by with hardly a mark on them, while others get cracked, chipped and dirty. As people, some of us sail contentedly through life, while others face unimaginable suffering, which leaves its mark. Most of us fall somewhere in between. As a church family, we need to gather around those who are struggling or hurting and be boots on the ground, as Guy put it, supporting one another with prayer and care. But we can also worship God in the middle of those dark places because he promises to be with us in the valley and at the end of the day, with him forever. Jesus said to his disciples, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. And he goes on to say in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Those who put their faith in Jesus have been given the promise of eternal life with him. Do you believe it? David did. In verse six, he declares he will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He is sure that he will be with God forever. How about you? In 1 John 5, it says, and this is the testimony, God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son, has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Notice it says, has life? Right now. The future has already begun. If I'm honest, I know I sometimes wonder, is it really true? Little voices of doubt rise up that say, can this really be true? Surely it's too good to be true. In the story of Jesus and Jairus's daughter in Mark 5, Jairus has come to find Jesus to ask him to help him heal his sick daughter. But messengers come to tell Jairus, don't bother Jesus because your daughter's already dead. But Jesus says to him, she's just asleep and they laugh at him. In the message version, he then turns to Jairus and says to him, don't listen to them, trust me. And his daughter is healed. When those voices of uncertainty come, he says to us, don't listen to them, trust me. When people make fun of you because of your faith, trust me. When you step out to tell others about me, trust me. When the problem seems too big, trust me. Jesus' word, God's character is our warranty. We have nothing to fear because he is near. Let's take hold of that today. We have nothing to fear because he is near. Our future is secure. He is the good shepherd committed to watching over us. When we take hold of this, we can obey his commands with confidence, stand on his promises with excited expectancy and look forward with assured anticipation. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing, not now, nor in the future. But you know, sometimes a good shepherd needs to bring the sheep back in line, rescuing them from potentially dangerous situations, holding them with his rod and his staff. We don't have time to explore this in depth today, but David knew that in the hands of a good shepherd, these tools of correction and protection were a comfort 
So it is with a loving God who gently rescues us from our own folly when we go off on our own, following our own path, which might not end well. He sees what we do not. And I find that incredibly comforting. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. We go on to verses five and six. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. In many sheep rearing countries of the world, the summer pasture is the most sought after in the high plateaus of the mountains. These plateaus are often called tables. Perhaps that's what David was thinking about here. The shepherd would scout out the land before taking the sheep to it, clearing away poisonous plants, looking for predators that could be dangerous for the flock and checking out where to make camp, where to find water and so on, preparing the table. But it was customary in ancient Israel that covenants between people were often sealed with a big banquet. At that banquet, a distinguished guest would be anointed with oil as a sign of blessing and a seal on their relationship. Maybe that's what's on David's mind, a sign of God sealing those promises that he makes to us. We don't really know what he was thinking, but the impression is that he's feeling blessed, reassured, loved and drawn to worship the God who is the best shepherd imaginable. We're currently living in Exeter, just a short walk from the river. I don't know if you're familiar with Exeter Quay, but as you look down the river with the quay behind you and the river in front of you, it looks as if it's peacefully flowing downstream. The water is calm and looks like this. But if you walk a little further downstream and look back, you get a very different view. What you cannot see as you look ahead is the weir with its turbulent water. From where we stand, the water may look calm and all is peaceful, but you can't see what's coming. What a joy, what a blessing to have a shepherd that's gone before us and prepares the way, but who's also able to fulfill the promises he's made to us because he is almighty God and my heavenly father at the same time. Compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, who says to his children, I will never fail you or abandon you. No wonder David can say, surely goodness and love will follow me all of my days. And so can we. But you know, maybe that's not quite where you are today. Maybe you're struggling to see Jesus in the middle of a deep valley. Maybe you don't even have a relationship yet with God. So if you would like to have someone pray with you or would like to explore more about the Christian faith, we would love to hear from you. Our contact details are on the website, so please get in touch. You know, the thing about a warranty is it only starts once it's activated. You need to register your purchase to make it valid. We are being offered the greatest warranty the world has ever known. When I activate that warranty and make the Lord my shepherd, I can carry the assurance of his promises with me. The warranty, the guarantee that gives me confidence as I see his hand in the wonders of the world around me, reminding me of his presence and my guarantee that as his child, God has rescued me and brought me into a relationship with him. That so fills my mind, body and spirit, that my whole life becomes an act of worship in all that I do and say. That I have hope when I use the shield of faith and wield the sword of the spirit, knowing the Lord is by my side and he has already won the victory. That gives me conviction and confidence when I tell others about the good news, what Jesus has done for me, has done for me, is doing for me, and that this is a free gift for you too. That though I may be a cracked pot, I have one who hears my cry and rescues me and gives me a new song to sing. And that reassures me of his presence in the dark places, 
and gives me a hope to look forward to of eternity with him, where there is no more death, mourning, crying or pain. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. I want to finish by showing you a short film. It's a group of children explaining what Psalm 23 means to them.